He's America working God. He's America working God. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is America working God. All right. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And this morning, we're going to read over a whole chapter. We're going to read over Luke chapter 6, and we'll probably go down and, and break it down over the next coming weeks, uh, minus next week. But, um, so for those of you on TikTok, hey, good morning, everybody. For those of you on, on YouTube, give me a victory Jesus in the comments, and uh, like and subscribe if you haven't. Anyway, as we go into Luke chapter 6... It's going to be talking a little bit about Jesus and the Sabbath, and then it's going to go into the Sermon on the Mount. So let, let's go ahead and, and read Luke chapter 6. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how they entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. These guys are coming with, with their religious laws, the laws of the Old Covenant, and trying to tell Jesus, Hey, look, why are you guys doing this? Why are you feeding your bodies to strengthen yourself, taking care of yourself in an unlawful way on the Sabbath? You're breaking our rules. And Jesus is like, Hey, look, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. These men need to take care of themselves, just as David and his men did. God would have them want to stay strong and healthy so that they could continue to serve Him and show love. A lot of people get lost with that. But we're not to get lost in religious rules, man-made rules. We're to get lost in a relationship with Christ Jesus. To truly serve God with our heart. To respect Him. That's what God wants. He don't want somebody who robotically follows rules to try to make themselves look good. God understands that even the most perfect person on this world is flawed. And in God's eyes, any flaw isn't enough. You're not good enough. But God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to cover those flaws. To make a way for us. In the same way, we're to look at others who are flawed and to share with them the same kind of love we've been shared with. A man with a withered hand. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him but he knew their thoughts and he said to the man with the withered hand come and stand here and he rose and stood there and Jesus said to them I ask you is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm to save life or to destroy it after looking around at them all he said to them stretch out your hand and he did so and his hand was restored but they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus stop and think about this they're looking for a reason to persecute Jesus they're looking for any reason to, to try to make what he's doing wrong because they know that he's the son of God they don't want to lose their power. They already know that he's doing these miracles by the power of God, but they're trying to look for a loophole to make it look wrong. 
How do I know that they know this? Look at John chapter 3. Nicodemus come to Jesus and said, We know that no one can do these things except by God. So they know who they're messing with, but they're trying to find a loophole. Nothing new. That kind of stuff goes on today. It went on then. If you look in, in um, Daniel's time, it went on then. They made a decree that if he prayed against, if he prayed to any God except for the king, that he must be killed. That's how he ended up in the lion's den. He stayed faithful to God. The king realized, man, I made a mistake, but I got to stay to what I said. And God brought him through it. Understand, when you take that stand, people, religious people might come up against you. But God will be with you. And we need to trust him. The twelve apostles. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night, he continued to pray to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from the twelve, chose from them twelve, sorry, whom he named apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Altheus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas, who became the traitor, Judas Iscariot. You know, Jesus called Judas knowing he was a traitor. We were talking a little bit about that. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew where this guy's heart was headed. Knowing that somebody was completely against him in the end, he loved him regardless. He loved him in his flaws. He told Judas, go and do what you must do. Because Jesus knew that his father's will had to be done and that that must play out. And he continued to show that love. And that's the kind of love we're to show to somebody who does evil and wrong to us. It's hard. It's real hard. But God can help us to become that way through the Holy Spirit. He can give us that, that, that point of growth. He can bring us through it. If we truly fear Him, and I don't mean fear as in like the modern day, hey, look at that, that guy scared me, he's dressed up like a clown, he might kill me kind of fear but the kind of fear that is a reverent respect to truly follow him, to trust him. You know, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Jesus ministers to a great multitude. And when he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed with their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cared, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. I love this because you think about this, think about this for a minute. All this crowd, all this great multitude from all over, they were touched, they were healed, they were cured. It didn't mean that they accepted Christ, it didn't mean that they followed him. They had all this great love pouring out from God and they sought it but when push came to shove that same multitude turned on him and put him on the cross when we do things we shouldn't be doing them for popularity 
some of those who are closest to you are going to be the first ones to, to hang you. They're looking for your fall. So we need to make sure that in this life when we're living, that we're living for God, for His direction, for where He's wanting us to reach. We all got somebody we can reach. Let me tell you, as a Christian, there are people out there you can reach that would listen to you that wouldn't listen to me or any other preacher. You can tell people what God's done in your life. You can tell people why you have hope in Him. And that's what God wants us to do. The Beatitudes. And he lifted up his eyes and his disciples said, Blessed are those who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Those who truly have trust, who, who, who are relying on God for everything, not the ones that this world considers rich, who has a prideful heart and spirit, but those who are humble, who have lowered themselves to know that God's the only way that can provide. When you got so much that you're trusting in your riches, that's a big thing in the Bible is Baal worship. A lot of people followed money, mammon. We're not to do that. If you have money, that's all right. God's not against you having money. But God wants to make sure that if you do have money, that your heart's still right. And that you're using that money in a way that will bring glory to Him. It says, Blessed are those who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. You know, how many of us have weeped? Recently in my family, I, I've wept. I've gone through some rough times, and I know everybody else has. You know? But it reminds me that there's a time to cry. There's a time to laugh. We don't give up. We stay strong. We trust in God. He's going to bring us through it. He's going to bring us through that hurt and pain. We're going to be able to laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and they revile you. and spurn your name as evil on the account of the Son of Man. Think about that. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they're putting you down, when they revile you. They can't stand you. Maybe they're talking about you all the time. Maybe they're trying to make you look bad. But it says that if they're doing that on the account of the Son of Man, if they're doing that because you love God and they can't handle that, it says you're blessed. It's not a bad thing. It's a good fruit. It says to rejoice. It goes on right here and says, Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For your fathers. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Don't give in and give up and give that person the evil they want. Continue to show them love. The Bible says if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. The Bible says this will heap coals upon their head. It will. It, it, it will get to them. They'll be at some point in their life thinking, man, all this evil I've done. I had people at my high school reunion come to me and said, Chris, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry for the way I treated you. I've been waiting to see you all these years to say that. I was really mean and evil to you. I looked at him and said, it's okay. I forgave you a long time ago. I laughed along with you. We gotta be able to, to, to give it to God. 
to not carry that around. To let God grow us through it. Jesus pronounces woes. But woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation. Woe to you that are rich. Like I said, there's good people that have money. There's Christians that have money. But many of the normal average rich people in this world think and trust their money. Their money's everything to them. You know, in 1929 when the stock market fell, people committed suicide, jumped out of the buildings in Wall Street because they thought they'd lost everything, the reason for living. Money, wealth, it comes and goes. But that love that God gave us, it lasts forever. Woe to you who are full. Now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You know, it's reminding us that, hey, it's the opposite of what we were talking about a minute ago. When we're crying, we can look forward to knowing the fact that we're going to be able to laugh again. God's going to bring us through it. We're going through good times. Understand that we're not promised a perfect ride here on earth. We will go through times when we hurt. But if we have our faith in God, we know that He's with us through those valleys. We're not alone. And in the end, we have eternity. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to false prophets. If everybody seems to agree with you, if everybody seems to be on the same bandwagon as you, chances are you're compromising your message as you're talking to different people. Be careful. Tell the truth. Tell the truth and don't change the message to fit people's sin. God, don't change for people. People change because of God. It's part of our repentance process. That's why He gives us the Holy Spirit. He helps us to grow. A child, think about it, as a teenager, you might respond one way to a certain situation, blow it all out of proportion. 20 years later, you can be faced with a similar situation and handle it a lot different. You grow and change. You learn. God's here to teach us. Love your enemies. But I say to you, who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Too often, one who strikes you on the cheek offers, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer also the other one. To the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others do to you, do also to them. That's the golden rule. Do unto others as others do to you. You know, I, I love this because... As I read this, I, I realize that I, I, I read this passage in Pete's Bible, the Hebrew Bible, last night. And when it says, pray for those who abuse you in Pete's Bible, it worded it completely different. It says to, to, to pray for them in a good manner. Pray for their needs. To not pray evil upon them. No, don't pray, oh God, put them through the same abuse they're putting me through. Get them back. No, it's saying don't pray abuse on them. 
that we're saying pray for their needs. We often need to remember this as we pray for leadership in, in this world. Too many people get stuck on this and that and they want to hate on the leadership. But God says pray for them. Pray that they find God. Instead of praying that God strikes them down like I know some people do. Every man is flawed. Every leader is too. But we're to love others as we would have others love us. Thirty-two. If you love those who love you, what benefit is it that you, for it? even sinners, love those who love them? And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. I love this. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. We were talking a little bit about Judas. Think about it. Can we learn to be kind to those who are evil towards us? That's what Jesus is trying to tell us here. He's trying to tell us to learn to do that. He's trying to tell us to trust him. To show that love no matter how much it hurts. It says, if you love those who love you, what good is that? Even the sinners do that. He wants you to think, can you love those who hate you? He's pointing out that he is kind to the evil and the ungrateful. Stop and think about what evil and ungrateful is to God. That's those who haven't started a relationship with him. We've all been there at one point. We all didn't seek God at one point. Everyone is lost until they find Christ. Judging others. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Now you can find this same passage in Matthew, the end of Matthew chapter 6 and the beginning of Matthew chapter 7. It's the, it's the same passage and what you find when you read into that. When it's talking about judging, it's not looking at somebody and saying, hey look man, the way you're living is sinful. If we're talking about a Christian brother, we should be bringing it to him, hey look man, you're, you're starting to go down a, a bad road, you know. God's not going to bless your sin. The kind of judgment it's talking about when it says judge not, it's not my place to look at somebody and say you're going to hell. It's not my place to be able to look at somebody and say you're going to heaven. Because only two people know whether or not that person has accepted what Christ did for them. Whether or not they have a relationship and that is them and God. But what it does remind us to do is to forgive. It reminds us to forgive and it says we will be forgiven. We're not to walk around with animosity and, and, and hate built up. A lot of people get lost in forgiveness, so they start wondering what is forgiveness? Think about this, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is saying, okay, Lord, I put this in your hands. I trust you. It don't mean that there's restoration or reconciliation. You forgive first. Then if that person comes to you and wanting to reconcile, be open to hear them. But that don't mean that you have to put yourself in a place where your relationship's restored to where they're going to hurt you. 
it means that you're open to reconcile. Okay, I'll hear you out. Maybe we were super close at one time, now we'll be on speaking terms. You want to be close at one time, maybe I'll give you that chance, but we're going to see how you do with speaking terms first. Forgiveness is a process. You, you forgive, so you're not carrying around that weight. You're open to them coming and working things out. But it don't mean that you have to put yourself in the same position and get hurt over and over again. A lot of people think forgive means I'm automatically right back where I was no it took me a lot of Bible reading to realize that give and it will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together running over will be put into your lap for the measure you use, it will be measured against you. This is the one measured back against you. This is the one that really got me when it came to unforgiveness. I used to be like, hey, I forgive you, but I don't have to talk to you. Ever again, I don't want to see you no more. And it's like, well, the measure you use is going to be used back against you. You pick that up a little better in Matthew chapter 6. It's like, you're going to be forgiven as you forgive. Could you imagine getting to heaven and and and... and the Lord saying, I forgive you, but I don't want anything to do with you. You know, that's the measure. If, if you're forgiving that way, it's like, I don't want that. I want a true relationship with God. Which is why he's trying to teach us to forgive in the same way. We were forgiven when we didn't deserve it. We don't need to be looking around and be like, oh, you don't deserve forgiveness. No, let, let it go. Let God handle it move forward with your life. Don't let that weight weigh you down. Cause you stress and burdens. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eyes, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, I love this because when we look at somebody, Jesus used a really good illustration here. If we see a speck in their eye, right, it's tiny. But as they're looking through their eye, that speck is big. It's like a log. So we could both have specks, but from your first person perspective, yours is bigger because it's right up on your eye lens. Jesus is saying, don't try taking care of everybody else's before you've taken care of yourself. Get yourself right with God first. Then help others to get right. That's that repentance when we come to Christ. That, a lot of people get lost in repentance. The word for repentance is metanoia. It means to change living for myself no more. I need to live for God. That's what our change is. God gives you the tools. He gives you the Holy Spirit to help you. It don't mean that you're going to be perfect. None of us will ever be perfect. A tree and its fruits. For no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For the fig is not gathered from the thorn bush, nor grapes picked from the bramble bush. The good person, out of good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of the evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, the mouth speaks. Where is your heart? You know, how do you know if your heart's set in the right place? 
Do you pray regularly? Do you seek God daily? That's the only way your heart's going to be set, right? To have that peace that surpasses all understanding, to be able to rejoice and have a love that surpasses knowledge. It's to be able to truly have a heart for God. Build your house on the rock. Why do you call me Lord? Lord, and not do what I tell you. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a building whose house is dug deep in the land and the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and a stream broke against the house, it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream comes and broke against it, immediately it fell apart. The ruin of that house was great. You know, as I've said before, if you truly believe you're going to live it, Jesus says, if you say you believe in me, you call Lord, Lord, why don't you do what I tell you? He says, the one who does what I tell him, he's going to handle those storms in life. His faith's going to be strong. He has that hope to know that in the end, the Lord is in control. But if you don't do it, do you truly believe? You know, John 14, 15 says, if you love the Lord, you'll keep his commands. Jesus took all his commands and rolled them up into two. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Make God everything, you know, and uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was given us instructions in this passage on how to do that. He loved you so much that he gave his life for you. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes should not perish. Anybody that believes but have everlasting life. You might think it's too late for you. You might think you've done too much. 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but the world through him might be saved. Reason it says, Mike, you have a choice to make. Do you want to accept that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that you're a sinner and could not pay your way, and that he rose again in three days, that he's the one and only Son of God? If you do, you're going to heaven. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Start a relationship with Christ Jesus today. It makes an eternity a difference. Be blessed.